Welcome everybody back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin Lee Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY in Midtown Manhattan at the City University and it's a kind of a little gray day in New York. Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, one or two Celsius. I always forget how old it is in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the Fahrenheit is in the 40s and uh, yeah reality uh, has set in that the winter is coming and uh, New York it doesn't look so great. You go around, the restaurants are empty, people are desperate, stores are still closing. Um, there are announcements from the mayor de Blasio that there might be a shutdown lumen in the next couple of days, which of course would again be uh, devastating. And, uh, and uh, still no theater, no nothing up on the horizon for the next uh, year, most probably. And, um, and even the Met Opera can't pay their uh, union workers. So uh, we are in uh, very deep trouble. And But uh, sometimes, as uh, Japanese haikus say, when the house roof is broken, you can see the moon through uh, in the night. And so this is what we talk about. Uh, uh, the moon itself, uh, which is the theater, and the hands that points towards it. These are artists. These are um, people who work in the field of theater and the ones who really help us pointing uh, to it, to the words, the literature, the ideas of it, our dramaturgs, uh, which has now become a much more enlarged uh, definition, but it's like a, in the Torah that people are pointing with the, with the golden hands on the scripture. They don't fully touch them, but they are the ones who interpret them, help them connect us, create meaning. And um, so we've always said artists are very close uh, to the times we live in. They have the ability to, to be in the moment, to, to anticipate the future. And this is why it is so important to listen to them. And in this kind of enlarged understanding of a theater artist, in our view, producers, uh, uh, curators, uh, uh, and dramaturgs, uh, theater artists who help us to collage, to put things together, to create meaning for a moment in time, like the Robert Rauschenbergs did in the 20th century, that great invention of collaging things, creating meaning that you can look at on many sides. Dramaturgy is a staple in the uh, European theater. Um, the great uh, directors will not start working if they don't have one, two, sometimes as Peter Stein insisted, three of the top mm -hmm. dramaturgs. Sometimes in America you hear from uh, people who run theater as well as my director is so stupid and he can't interpret a play, then I wouldn't hire the director. It just shows you the big differences. And we at the Siegel Center, of course, and at the university are on the side of transferring knowledge, of performing knowledge. And dramaturgs are essential guides um, into the underworld um, uh, that theater takes us by the hands. They're like uh, uh, in the uh, Dante's uh, great, uh, great, um, great tales, you know, when poets take us to explain what life is all about. Um, today we have two representatives, two great ones, so people who represent the fields, but also just themselves, um, who have uh, defined also what dramaturgy means, uh, what it is all about uh, in the US, and they also have really worked for the field and for the advancement um, of the field. So with us, I first of all welcome Ken and Martin. Thank you for coming, taking the time, uh, and uh, Martin, uh, uh, Gray Green Rogers is the associate professor at SUNY in New Paltz. So in a way, we are connected CUNY and SUNY, you know, State and City University. And she is also a past president of LMDA, the great literary managers and the dramaturgs of America Association, which really has done so much uh, for the field. We had Anne Catania with us uh, before and others. So um, uh, this is close to um, our heart. Um, she uh, is a, a dramaturg who has who worked at the Louisville Orchestra. She has worked uh, with the Salt Lake Acting Company, uh, the Pioneer Theatre Company, at the Goodman, the Great Goodman Theatre, and though many, many, many works at these, what one would say, almost legendary Oregon Shakespeare uh, Festival. Uh, Ken uh, Soniglia is a veteran dramaturg, writer, and a creative consultant, and actually also a community organizer. He worked uh, with shows that ended up and were on Broadway, like the Great Hades Town and uh, Peter and the Starcatcher, and he worked for 16 years at Disney's Theatrical, where he worked on over 70 productions that were connected uh, to Broadway. You can uh, look up the number, but it's a big, big, big productions under The Hunchback of Notre Dame, The, the Little Mermaid, The Tarzan, and so many, many others. And he also was a president of LMDA, and he holds a PhD in theater history and criticism from the University in Washington. So both of you um, 
Welcome and to Siegel Talks. And um, where are you guys? Martin, maybe you start. Sure. I am coming to everyone from the lands of the Lenape peoples, and mm -hmm. which has the colonized name of West Hurley, New York. <laughs> uh -huh. So you are in New York City? N me? No, I'm actually... Uh, yeah, in so I'm about... I'm about to, if you left my house right now and drove to Port Authority, uh, it would take two hours. Two hours, okay. Okay, and Ken, where are you now at the moment? Um, also in the, the sprawling lands of the Lenape people, but uh, in Harlem, New York, uh, and uh, right on a, a fantastic line of ambulances going to, to, the, to the hospital. So I may have to mute if a siren's coming by um, I mean, as people are attended to, yeah. We have done that since March, and we have heard the sirens in March, April, May, and June, and slowly going down the talks, the sounds of the sirens, and they are back um, on the yeah. street. It's a, it's a devastating moment um, for the world and for all of us. And um, so really, um, thank you for taking the time to think about theater, which is not easy to do. And yes, and the question is, are the airwaves also are on the Lenape and the ground? So in a way, we are... Uh, 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 also communicating, you know, in these, uh, in the ethers of, uh, of that, you know, um, so spirited land, uh, what America um, is all about. So both of you, what's, there's no theater, there are no performances and, um, and then dramaturgy, which is in a way the poet almost, uh, as uh, Norm Frisch, who helped us to connect me to you guys, who said, you know, dramaturgs in the way of the poets of theater, they are so important, but um, it's a tough field to be in in America. Um, are you guys working at the moment? Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, you know, with the with the production shutdown, I feel like uh, almost everyone uh, has entered a dramaturgical mindset, right? Like mm -hmm. without the sort of busyness of like going to production, doing something, but actually, well, what are we doing um, and planning for it? I found that uh, I, I left um, Disney Theatrical a year ago. So I was already entering into a period of sort of sabbatical and, uh, and rethinking. And then the world did uh, with the pandemic. So uh, I, it, it's been a really interesting time for, for dramaturgy and to sort of re rethink it. And a lot of people are spending more time uh, writing, planning production. So in fact, <laughs> Tom Turks in general are uh, quite busy uh, on a lot of projects, even though, you know, many of us who work in institutional gigs uh, uh, were furloughed. Um, and, and so, you know, paying the bills is a little bit of a challenge, but uh, but the work is there and the, and the art is there and still happening as we prepare to uh, come back and, and be in rooms together. Can you talk about some projects you have now? Uh, I, can I? I was going to add to okay, you a go. little bit too. <laughs> I was going to add a little bit to what Ken was yes. saying. I think also one of the things that's happening that I'm so excited that dramaturgs are being asked asked to participate in, and is that as uh, theater is really rethinking what it is and who it is in light of the Rona, in light of what is happening in terms of the uh, civic engagement uh, that has happened sort of nationally as a result of cases such as George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, dramaturgs are really being asked to help reimagine what theater will look like when it does come back, especially in terms of social justice and cultural competency. And I am really excited that I've been part of some of those conversations and I'm really hopeful that the, the theater community will continue to tap dramaturgs to really rethink what that looks like. And on that note, I'm gonna pass it to Ken so Ken can talk about what he's been up to and then I will follow up with mm -hmm. the shenanigans in the life of Martine. <laughs> Um, uh, one, one of the great things since Martine and I are both uh, as past president still quite connected to the workings of uh, LMDA, um, one of the things I'm, uh, I'm proudest to work on is this uh, Dramaturging the Phoenix project that we started, um, which is uh, asking dramaturgs to uh, think about what theater will look like through a dramaturgical lens. Um, when we come back and start making it again in the way that we're used to in terms of live performance. Um, and that's generated uh, several dozen essays 
um, we ask people first to engage in sort of this essay form um, and share short essays, you know, one or two pages uh, just to throw some ideas out. So uh, we started that essay call in April and then shortly thereafter we started a weekly forum chats, you know, much like you've been doing, Frank, uh, uh, and just talking about, you know, topic based uh, dramaturgical projects. So that, that's been really fun and, and we've been able to gather in a consistent way um, and, and talk about what, what does it look like? You know, what are the things that we've been doing in, in our systems that we're longing to come back to? And what are those systems that have actually just not worked? You know, and I think as Martine was saying, <clears throat> with Black Lives Matter movements and we see white American theater and really just looking at, you know, we, we pat ourselves on the back a lot of times in, in the theater community for being pro progressive, for being liberal, for being inclusive, but we fail just as much as other human institutions do. So to really be able to look at that and to say like, what can drama terms do in our particular way in contributing to the making of theater and related arts? How can we expand the conversations about context and meaning? Um, so, so that's one of the things I've been doing, which is really just sort of community dramaturgical work. How do we function? Um, and, and some advocacy work within that uh, I've been working on. And then I've been able to, you know, one of the things I wanted to do when I left an institutional job is to also work on some writing projects. So I've been, you know, working on some new projects, um, some musicals as a, as a one of the writers, um, and then also been dramaturging some other projects, but thinking about new ways to do it. Like one, one project I'm working on is working with a group of teens um, and uh, developing artists, uh, which is a New York City based uh, program and, uh, and creating a writer's room with them for a project which would have a wide audience, much larger than they normally have. Um, and how does that work? So trying to figure out like how to find new ways of dramaturging um, that I haven't done before. That, that sort of like we're in this innovative space now where we're like nothing's happening. So let's just make new things. Um, and that's been exciting. Yeah. And to follow up with that, I think along with the initiatives that we've been doing that Ken just eloquently talked about in terms of LMDA, uh, for me, uh, I, and I'm going to own all of the, the privilege and blessings that the statement that I'm about to make comes with, but I am actually busier than I've been prior to that, which is saying a lot because I was busy before Rona happened. Uh, so at this point, I distinctly have the advantage of being both an educational and institutional and a freelance dramaturg. So uh, in the age of the Rona, I end up being onboarded with by the Playwright Center in Minneapolis. And so I'm doing some amazing work with their Jerome and Many Voices fellows right now. And essentially I function as their personal dramaturg, which has been so great in terms of thinking about development and fostering new voices. Um, of marginalized uh, voices in the theater. And I also have been working like right now, I am, I just finished up some work with the, at, uh, with Roundhouse and the McCarter, they're doing, they're doing the Adrian Kennedy Festival, which I would suggest anyone check out if you have right. a chance just because how often do you get to see Adrian Kennedy's work? Let's just be honest about this. So one of the things that I've also found uh, in terms of like, if there is joy to be found at all and what it is that our entire field is going through right now and just us as a society and a community and as a nation, um, we have started to figure out ways of providing access to, uh, to theater and uh, sort of theatrical productions, even if they're not theater in the way that we're used to in a way that really makes me happy. Um, and, and so working on that project, and then uh, and I'm also working on a digital project that um, is being shot in a theater. Marin is doing a co-pro with uh, Roundhouse Theater on Lauren Gunderson's new piece, The Catastrophist. So I've been working with all of, with that amazing creative team on that. And so it's been really interesting for me watching, especially in the realms of digiturgy and digital storytelling, all of the ways that uh, dramaturgy is being tapped to be used in the way that artists are really trying to figure out how to continue to storytell, even if we can't all share space together all the time, or if we can, it's in very limited quantities with lots of COVID testing happening in the in-between. So it's, it's, been, it's been a really interesting time. 
it's uh, uh, that's stunning. That's uh, different from all the talks we, we, we had. That both of you, the way say, in a way, there's more to do. But tell us a bit about the conversations you both say. You say we are working with responding to the field. And yes, also theater got a bit caught up in the, in the uh, Black Lives Matter moment where we said, yes, we, we, we didn't do enough. But um, also with the digi dramaturg, as you say, or with dramaturg and all, what, what conversations are you having with theaters? What are theaters asking of you? And what are you guys asking of theaters? Uh, for example, uh, uh, yesterday's uh, uh, topic on uh, dramaturgy in the Phoenix was um, No More Christmas Carol. Uh, and so we were actually just t talking about, and we've had previous conversations about, do we, you know, what would happen if we all took a year off from Shakespeare, right? Like what, what voices are um, not, not being uh, allowed access to the light, to the stage that we could if some of the, the go-tos that we rely on because they're familiar, um, it's not, not, not any um, value judgment about the quality, but it's just like, you know, what, where do we go for comfort um, in the familiar? Uh, and, and also, you know, the very real consideration of like, what will sell tickets, you know, what, what's, uh, what's the easiest thing, we've got to pay our bills kind of thing. But then when does that lend itself to um, some, some cynicism or, or, or laziness, you know, where do we have to put ourselves out there? Um, and one of the things that dramaturgs do is, you know, uh, is read plays and get to know writers and be in a position of being advocates um, for, 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 for new writers, uh, for new ways of thinking. And so we were talking about like, is there something that we can do in our field with this conversation in order to say like, have a guide for like new ways of looking at your December programming theaters, right? And then like have a list, like the Kilroys do, of, like new plays coming up, but like a list of like other things to consider for holiday programming that are maybe more inclusive or on a rotating basis or like a flow chart, like, things to consider and recognizing it these are money things to consider these are thematic things to consider these are audience things to consider but essentially you know creating a handbook for for our colleagues and theater makers and producers and decision makers to be like hey we can help out maybe let's start to have some new conversations if these are not already happening um here's some here's a guide uh, to start that and we can update it over time. So that's just an example of the kind of brainstorming we're doing so that when we do come back, um, we've got more tools. We're having other conversations. We're opening up new doors and, you know, let's build back better idea. What does that actually look like in, in the theater? Right. And to add to that, I think for me specifically, I th what I've seen happen, at least the way that people are approaching me is one as a resource in terms of you know, one of the things that I've always done, and this is just who I am as a human being, uh, I've always been the person that has been interested in talking about uh, the sort of intersections of, or, or, or not even the intersections, who, who are the voices that always get lost in these conversations? Um, for example, when people are talking about Shakespeare, I'm talking about August Wilson. When people are talking about Chekhov, I'm talking about Lynn Nottage. Um, when people are talking about the new exciting voices, I'm talking about Charlie E. Von Simpson. I'm talking about Frankie Gonzalez. I'm talking about Emma Stanton. So I'm talking about just voices that have yet to be heard. And so one of the things that's been really fun for me is now that people know that I read just a ridiculous number of plays over the course of a year, uh, when they are thinking about programming their seasons, whether it's internally at SUNY New Paltz, whether it's, you know, outside and uh, of here and just talking to theaters about work that I'd like to work on as a dramaturg or as a director, um, or just even writing things. Uh, people are asking, Martin, what are the things that you're reading? And mm -hmm. the thing that's amazing about it is that I have such a vast, uh, list uh I, my running joke is i have a binder full of playwrights <laughs> that i can share to say that there are so many amazing stories out there that are not being told and i could just go on and on and gush about all of them and try to help be that advocate that ken was just talking about in terms of making sure that these voices are heard while we're in this moment of pause but then also this moment of coming out on the other side of the pause and really just starting to plan for what is next. So it's been amazing having that opportunity to be in those conversations. 
And it's a critical moment too, that because we are in this moment of pause, it's recognizing this is our shot, right? Like th it's now because part of uh, the challenge has been in some of the dramaturgical conversations we'd love to have with our colleagues, it's just finding the time in the space to do it. Cause you know, theater makers are always like scrambling to survive, to put the thing up. And as soon as it's up or, you know, putting the next thing up, which is great, right? But because we have this pause and there's so many challenges associated with what are the opportunities? And this is one of them. Like, this is the window to get in there and open up new conversations while people are planning to come back. There's been this sort of unprecedented availability of people to, to Zoom, to have connections that they wouldn't normally have to open up minds uh, and, and consider new things that we just haven't had before because see the people are some of the busiest people in the world. And then everything went poof. Um, so, so what, what, what is that opportunity? And, uh, and we've, we've done it in, uh, in our organization too, just to really foster these conversations. Cause again, like people are busy and this is time where we've carved out some regular time to have these conversations. So when we do get busy again, which will hopefully happen, um, we'll, we'll do it. We'll get busy in a different way, you know, and, uh, and, and hopefully be more open and use e each other as resources in a way I think that we haven't been able to do before. It's been, it's been really inspiring. Agreed. So um, do you guys think, is this a time of change? Will theater be different? A post-pandemic theater, if we can call it that way. Do you, is it gonna be different? I, th I think so, right? Uh, also because, you know, I'm that guy who's like, well, we'll make it different, right? <laughs> and <laughs> so, it, which is, can be naive, um, but, uh, but I do feel like that this is the time to, to try to, to step in, to have conversations, to say, wait a minute. Uh, and I also feel, you know, with the, with the conversion uh, of the political, the economic, the social, the, the medical, um, uh, I feel like we're getting braver, you know, we're getting uh, more empowered to say stop, to say, wait a minute, to say that's not fair, to let's do this again. Um, so I, I, think, I think we will come back and we're humans and we will make many of the same mistakes, but I think some things will be better. And those things that are better, it's because you're changing the systems, changing the institutions, changing the rules now. So the same human beings are roughly gonna come back and hopefully with open doors so new human beings can come in there but we'll still be flawed. Can our systems be a little less flawed when we come back? And that's the work that we need to do now. Right, I have to admit that. So I'm just gonna own back to things that Martine owns before she says things. I am a realist uh, that, you know, has a tendency to try and be optimist about things, but I'm also a realist. So uh, the, 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 the optimist in me wants to say that things will be different. The realist in me is concerned that uh, with the, there needs to come a change in the way that we talk about what is happening right now in order for a real change to happen. And what I mean by that is people keep talking about going back, returning back when back was flawed. It was not, a, what was happening before tended to- uh, What was wrong? What was wrong? Well, I mean, it tended to centralize uh, or center whiteness. It tended to marginalize and push to the side. You know, if you had an opinion that was outside of what was always normally done, you were seen as difficult. You were seen as like trying to like cause problems when really one was just fighting for what was right and what was just in a system that was flawed. And so I am worried that um, people in, in, in such a zeal to sort of pick back up and do what, we've, what we were doing pre-Rona, um, like that zeal, that, that, that interest will then sort of reinstitute policies that should have been examined or re-looked at, or even if the work was being done to look at them, the, the desire to let's just be honest, feed into the capitalist system that unfortunately theater does tend to feed into is just gonna uh, make people go back to what they were doing anyway. The, the, the desire is going to be to produce the things that are outside of the public domain and easily accessed because people are not gonna have enough money to purchase, purchase rights or whatever the, the excuse will be. 
in order to, to go back to whatever what was happening before. But I say all that mostly because I feel like if I keep putting that out into the universe, when things do pick back up, someone who is in a position of power will remember this moment and me railing against the fact that going back to what we were doing before was a problem and what we should do, like the dramaturg, like the namesake of dramaturging the Phoenix is about re being reborn anew. What have we learned from this moment? And can we take that information and move forward? And in the way that Ken said, we'll, we'll, make, we'll all make mistakes going forward, but at least we're looking forward as opposed to looking back to, uh, to reshape, rethink how we are going about doing this, doing the art. So, you know, I have to, I have to admit, I sit somewhere in between optimism and realism of like, I'm, I'm going to hope that we do something different and also recognize that there will be some places that will go back to the problematic things that they were doing before. If someone is listening now, one of the people, which I guess it is actually, people do listen to our talks. Now one listens who is in a position of power. What would you say to them? And you can really be open. Be and I mean, to be honest. What would you say? Yes, really. Start, really like, just start listening more. Like, because I mean, I think that's really the problem. People in positions of power aren't always listening or when they are listening, what they do is they listen so that they can say that they listen and then they do whatever they want to do anyway. And I think it's really about that time where people started listening, actually making decisions on how to move forward according to what it is that they are hearing. Because back to, there's nothing more frustrating, especially as an artist of color and as a black person to have someone ask me my opinion and then do whatever it is that they were going to do anyway, which is the complete opposite of what it was that I said they should do. And not to say that my voice um, is the only voice they need to be listening to, but if they're not listening to a wide variety of people and making decisions according to that, all of the information that they are gathering, they're already starting off on the wrong foot. So I really just recommend people really start to think about the actions, think about what, um, you know, and really just, really just listen, just listen to what the people in front of you are trying to tell you. <laughs> I'm going to stop talking now because I'm taking up a lot of space. But I, I think you're, uh, you, you hit the nail on the head and why, why we feel um, in the field that this is a moment to step forward to not only advocate for, for dramaturgy, but to share it more openly uh, as, as a process, as a way of doing work that collects, you know, people who have a vocation for this kind of thing. And what is a vocation? It's, you know, it's curiosity, it's deep listening, and it's a process orientation, which is what we need now <laughs> for a societal global level is not just, you know, a kind of um, transactional participation. Like I'm gonna listen for a second. So I said I could listen and then I'm gonna say what I wanna say but to really like, I'm gonna listen and I don't know how I'm gonna come out the other end, right? That sense of like openness and curiosity. And also, you know, the, the dramaturgs there as an artist at the table, but often at the service of uh, an author's voice, a director's vision, uh, 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 an institution's mission, and really questioning all of those things with the goal to make them all better. But it's the long, it's the long view there um, and to, you know, listen more deeply to come up with a bunch of suggestions, um, not necessarily just one, but, but a sense of like, well, the process could shift this way. Something can happen on a given day and to be there and be like, all right, well, what about this? Um, as a way to kind of get, get back on track. Um, and, and really just to, sh to share, to share this skill set, this orientation, um, with with more uh, of our peers, and um, you know, it's this interesting thing about the dramaturg often works um, uh, does a lot of straddling, right? Like those of us who've had institutional positions, we work for the producer, but we also work with and for the artists, other artists at the table, and we do this sort of translating work of communicating, you know, to the marketing department. They're like, now what's going on in the play? And to be able to like know what's going on into play, translate it into marketing terms or to go, you know, translate into legal terms or, um, you know, um, pr programming terms, but but to, to, to really think through those, um, 
those challenges. So it's not just, you know, the art versus the commerce, but how do those interact? How do we widen the audience, sell enough tickets to a certain thing to fund it, to pay for the next thing? Like we are working in a capitalist system. Like, can we have conversation about that? What is the function um, of what we're doing here? Can we make room for more people and still work on the sort of market-based economy? Um, when can create we create other spaces that are funded in different ways so we can try new things that are insulated a little bit from from the day-to-day -day ticket sales uh, concerns like well, we, we train in that these are the conversations that we have and and I feel like we we can help guide the conversations as as we come out of it and we've got skill sets that we're, we're we want to share um and you know we don't necessarily know the answers but since we're processing the answer like we can set up a good process for sort of getting to them um when we're ready so is the rising phoenix an initiative that started in corona time Tell yeah us absolutely us yeah, about absolutely what are the voices what are the most the 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 thing what people what people say, what they write. Give us a bit an idea, and also tell us where we can find it. Uh, sh sure, you can uh, you can go to the LMDA website or just search "Dramaturging the Phoenix" and it will take you there. Um, so members of our organization have access to all the essays, but we uh, we feature some outside the paywall so to get a taste um, uh, of what that is. So some of it's an internal conversation, and we're you know as like draft one <laughs> to okay. have some like it's some protect some protection, right? It should, like, be. it should be open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, and there are some outlets where we're opening it some more. We're trying to figure out ways to do that. Well, uh, you asked like where it came from and it came mm -hmm. from, it came in March when theaters were shutting down as people were getting furloughed. And, you know, everyone was worried. Those of us who are old enough to live through the last recession and get furloughed and worry about like, it was that kind of fear again. And so we came up with the Dramaturging the Phoenix challenge to get dramaturgs to like stay engaged. Like, what would you do? This is the time now to, to share your voice. And, and there weren't other parameters other than like, what will theater look like when we come back? What should it look like? And that was the only prompt. So some people share like how I'm feeling today. Other people talked about uh, parenting and dramaturgy, doing work that, we, you know, so we have those com conversations. We talked about who's at the table. Should we get rid of the table? Um, what are the structures that we have in place that are or aren't working? Um, you know, long conversations about se season planning or, you know, what gets programmed? What voices do we need to, to hear? How can we do that? So really every single essay is, uh, is quite different. And, we, and the, the one thing we did right away is date them because so many things in the time of Corona were changing from, from moment to moment, day to day, month to month, what was gonna happen next? Um, you know, for those of us in the United States, also dealing with, you know, a huge election year that was very volatile and polarizing. Um, so all of these things were, were operating at once, social unrest, uh, political unrest. But the most exciting thing, I think, so, so, so the essays, some people co-wrote them, um, some people wrote them alone, but then we put them in conversation with one another in these forums. Um, to try to get to to something next, and one of the things we did is is build a a, a series within the series, um, which is um, uh, BIPOC um, dramaturgs and allyship with with movements. And so Lindy Rosario, um, who's the LMDA uh, vice president for regional activity, she's she's curating those conversations, and they happen every third time. So, so we are talking a lot about, you know, what does it mean to be uh, a BIPOC identified dramaturg? What does it mean to be an ally? How do we make more opportunities? Where have we failed in the past? How do we uh, come out of that and do better? So, but, but we've had conversations about all sorts of things. And I shared with you like no more Shakespeare, no more Christmas Carol of, you know, taking a specific topic and, and trying to expand on that. Um, through essay writing and through these conversations, like the ones you've been hosting, but more always uh, dramaturgically oriented. Martine. Yeah, and I would say to add to that one, for those of you who are listening uh, or encounter this later, just know that, you've, that yes, some of our stuff does hide behind a paywall, but we do not turn away membership to people who, uh, who cannot afford to join. So please do not be afraid if you're interested in learning more about what LMDA is, how we function, all that fun stuff, and just getting more access to more of those essays to please reach out 
to us through uh, the contact form that you'll find um, or the contact email address you'll find on the website, we will, we will work with you. So just know that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I also want to give a quick shout out to our sibling organization, um, the Dramaturgs Network in the UK, because they have a very sort of similar uh, similar and not similar project running. Uh, they have they had a blog running during the height of the summer about what is it like to be a dramaturg in, in the UK in the time of the Rona. And so I would like to just point people towards that too, because it's really interesting to think about globally how this pandemic has really affected the entire field, both within this country, but then also outside of this country. Um, and sort of decentering the US is the only place where we can think about dramaturgy. So uh, yeah, and, and they're wrestling with a lot of very similar questions. So just wanted to put that out there. No, I think, yeah, it is, it is, this is the good news, I think, that people are talking to each other, people are listening to each other nationally on the local level, cities, but also internationally. And, um, and that, that field we, we, we care so much about. And uh, just to know, how, what was your personal journey? How did you become a, a dramaturg? How did you approach the field? Because I'm sure people are listening, so how do I become one? But how did you, well, what was your journey? Oh, that's so funny. Do, do you want to start this one, Ken? No, you go, Martine. <laughs> <laughs> we we actually we have it we have a crossing point in in our uh, right in our training exactly in our journeys. So yeah. I, in undergrad, was a theater and history double major for a while. I'm not gonna lie. In the end, I ended up graduating with history as a minor, but that's a whole long story that we're not gonna get into. But that was my background at Virginia Wesleyan, then college, now university. And to be honest, I am in a good way the 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 uh, the manifestation of what happens when deep listening happens on, on an educational level, because my amazing mentor advisor during that time, Dr. Sally Shedd, who is still there uh, at Virginia Wesleyan University, she listened to how I was talking about theater, really saw the potential in me to be a dramaturg. So one day she really did that, I'm gonna pull you aside. And she sort of gave me the, the longer version of, yes, I enjoy you as a performer, but have you heard about this particular field? <laughs> and so she started to explain to me what dramaturgy is and what it does. And I was like, really, that's the thing? I can do that? Sign me up. And so that basically became my baseline, the running joke amongst all of my friends. And this is where Ken and I's paths intersect is after I graduated from there, I went on to get my master's degree at Catholic University, which is also where Ken got his master's. And uh, the, the running joke amongst my friends is that I was going to be a, a professor by day, dramaturg by night. And that is the same slogan that everyone brings up whenever things happen <laughs> in my career. For example, the moment that I got tenure, a lot of the people in my Facebook feed were like, professor by day, dramaturg by night. <laughs> but I mean, that's basically how I ended up as a dramaturg, just someone really deep listening to who I was, how I was encountering plays, how I was thinking about the plays and really sort of, you know, I was that person who was thinking why this play, why this play now before I even realized that I should be asking the question why this play, why this play now. And so that is that is my trajectory and I've basically been doing it ever since undergrad. What about you, Ken? Um, well, uh, m many similarities uh, with Martine. Um, I'm a California kid, born and raised in LA. I went to UC San Diego for undergrad uh, as a psychology and theater double major, um, which I, I stayed longer in school. So I did end up finishing both ma majors. Um, but, uh, but while I was there at, at UCSD, which was a, a pretty outstanding training program at that time, they had an MFA in dramaturgy. So I had TAs and I, you know, I was exposed to it. I knew about it as a field. Uh, my specialty in, uh, while I was getting my theater degree was, uh, was in performance, acting and dance. I directed and produced a bit uh, in my last years there. Um, but so, but I hadn't, I hadn't had the call to dramaturgy yet, but I was always the one like sitting in the theater. I'm like, why'd you do that? What about this? What does this mean? Why, why did you produce this play? Right? Like having, not knowing like, <laughs> oh, you're a dramaturg. No one had told me that yet. Um, but when I went, I moved across the country to Washington DC, uh, which I have a very fond place in my heart for. 
and went to Catholic University, which is one of the oldest drama departments uh, and had been producing theater long before um, uh, Arena Stage was established by Zelda Fitchhandler. Um, but I finally took my first dramaturgy class. It, it was an MA in theater history and, and criticism. And I took my first uh, dramaturgy class uh, by uh, Mary Reesing there. And I was like, oh, this is good. And the literary manager, Kathy Madison from Arena Stage at that time, came in, into our class and talked about the literary department there and how it worked and, uh, and that they had interns. And I was like, hmm. And I applied for that internship and I got it the next year. So really that's sort of where I learned to do it. I got it. I was a production dramaturg on two plays, a Eugene O'Neill play and a brand new John Klein play and was at the table with professional actors, director, drama uh, designers and, and expected to deliver on a professional level. I was like, oh, I, 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 think that I'm a, I think I'm a dramaturg now, but I had the bug, right? And so even though I went on to get, um, as, as Martina and I, I went on and got a PhD, <laughs> Um, fully pre preparing to do what Martine does as a professor, although she she has about six full time jobs. If we dig into this conversation more, um, uh, but uh, but but shortly after uh, uh, finishing, um, I I got the call to industry, and ended up moving to New York and working um, for Disney and developing new plays uh, and musicals um, for about sixteen years. So next mm -hmm. chapter TBD. Right now I'm freelancing. Um, but, but that's sort of, sort of how I got the call. And while there are many ways to practice as a dramaturg, I'm like, that's who I am. Like that, that was just sort of recognizing vocation and then applying it however I could. Mm. So do you, let's say someone wants to be a dramaturg, do you think, can you study dramaturgy or what is the way? I think when, and Catania and Sidney Mahon was on the program, they also talked that they come from a generation that did it by doing, by joining theaters being taught apprenticeships models or do you study so what do you think where how should a dramaturg uh, what how is a dramaturg made or should it be made that's a good question i'm still learning so <laughs> right same here I'm still learning yeah I, I yeah i feel that's part of it is that that it because it is process oriented and you're and i'm learning uh, how to be a better dramaturg every time I do it, right? Uh, uh, figuring it out. I do think there are some things you can learn, absolutely. Like studying theater history to figure out, you know, globally, how has theater been conceived, made? How does it work? What are the structures of meaning? What is it about? How does it connect to society? Reading as many plays of all different types as possible, going to the theater, seeing it, but then actually then how to apply that, right? Because that's like, we got our degree, like, that's how you become a theater historian or, you know, a, a theorist and you write, um, but then how do you apply that to the making of theater? And that's the trick. And that's where you have to find out your own way to do it. And I, you know, like I said, I had a psychology degree. So there was that part of like listening, being in there, reading a room, understanding how things are working. When's the time to raise a question? When's not? I mean, there's all like for many dramaturgs because we work so closely with writers and other theater artists. There is the counseling function. There is the ear, there is the sounding board. So, you know, that was useful for me to actually formally study psychology. Um, but, uh, but a lot of it is just the practice. It's, it's how to be in the room at the service to bring these things to bear, this knowledge of structure, plays, comps, other endeavors in the theater to ask big questions about society, about history, about time, about place. Why are we here? What is it doing? How does this function? Um, but, but, but to be, to put all of that at the service of someone else's voice, someone else's vision for what happens right. at the stage and to just try to help that be the best thing and asking challenging questions at the right time, cheerleading at the right time, um, but that I've had to learn by doing, honestly. So you asked about, you know, do you, can you book study it or do you have to do it? And I feel like so much of it in terms of the practice has been doing it and then also talking with other dramaturgs. Cause often, you know, unlike in, in Germany where you get to like work with three dramaturgs on a project, often you're the solo artist um, doing that particular thing on a given place. So to be able to share practices with fellow dramaturgs has been so essential for me to learn how to try new things and do new things. Agreed. I think for me, it was definitely a combo of book learning and uh, doing the thing. Um, and I was lucky enough to be in programs that really encouraged the doing of the thing. And I was super blessed in that in my PhD program, um, I had my, uh, my, my mentor, uh, Patrick Sims, 
had just come off a contract at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And so he was like, uh, he's like, I know that I'm an actor and, you know, we're not quite in the same in the same places in the building, but there's someone you need to meet. And he introduced me to Louis Douth at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, which completely revolutionized the way that I thought about dramaturgy because being at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival where there are just so many dramaturgs running around at the same time and like uh, Louis and now Amritha have established a tradition of uh, making sure that all the dramaturgs who are there at the same time have a meeting together to just talk about the things that we are learning in our processes, talking about the challenges that we're having in our processes, talking about the, the exciting wins that we're having in our processes and really figuring out how to uh, help lift each other up in that space, especially because as Ken said, uh, the, the work can sometimes be lonely. <laughs> and so uh, like being in those spaces and learning from such amazing other artists uh, really helped me understand my own artistry in terms of being a dramaturg because I think that's the other thing that is still sort of a misconception and I partially blame educational institutions for uh, this idea that really what dramaturgy is is creating an actor packet and dropping it off and never to be seen again um, and I actively resist that in my program <laughs> and, uh, exactly I actively resist that in my program and one of the things that I feel so bad for my poor students is the the ones especially ones that transfer into our institution from other places where that is how they taught they're taught what dramaturgy is and I have to be like no boo that's not, I mean, that is a kind of dramaturgy and it's called research dramaturgy and that is not what we do here. Let me explain to you what it is that you're about to get yourself into. But, and so I think it is, you know, a combo of those things like learning the basics in terms of the theory, learning the basics in terms of structure, learning those basics, but then also, and then hopefully within your educational institution being exposed to a wide variety of structures, of plays, et cetera, so that you are equipped with enough resources somewhere in your toolbox that when you do go out into the world and then start learning how to do it with other collaborators that aren't in a learning situation as you are, that you are prepared and ready to have those challenging conversations. You know how to talk to a playwright to be that, that, that comfort, you know, on the first day of, of rehearsal and also be that comfort when, we op when, when it opens, but also be that comfort when you close a show. So those are all the things that you really just have to do in order to, to learn. So I think it's both. Mm -hmm. It's a journey to, oh, go ahead, Frank. No, go, go, go. I just wanted to add that, that, that it's, the, it's that journey uh, that, that, that some dramaturgical practice was for a long time research-based because apparently like before the Google, nobody knew how to go to the library and get some stuff. So dramaturgs were trained in that. Um, <laughs> but you know, now because so, so many facts, now you have to filter them, obviously, if you find your, uh, your information on the, on the internet. Um, but I, I, I taught for a few years, um, at, at Seattle's, uh, Cornish College of the Arts with John Wilson, who has, uh, taught there for many decades. And we taught a, a theater history, uh, through dramaturgy class. And, and he has this, uh, this story about like, so when I go out to find, if I'm, I'm, I'm a production dramaturg and I go out to like sort of find some information about like where this play came from, it's like, it's like taking an empty bucket and like journeying for a mile to a well to fill it, right? And so then I go and I fill it and then I bring it back. And it's, it, and he says like dramaturgy is not just like dumping off the bucket, it's, <laughs> it's sharing with the people <laughs> Uh, the journey, journey of going to the well. What well? How did you get there? What, you know, how much water did you decide to put in? Who did you meet on the way? Who did you meet on the way back? How are you transformed? And to have that conversation there, that's the dramaturgical conversation um, that really enhances, enhances mm -hmm. the work. And so like Martine, that's the way I've I practiced it too. It's an ongoing relationship. It's establishing mm -hmm. relationships with artists. It's ongoing relationship um with with the artists that then extends to the audience and everyone else to keep that conversation going which is why dramaturgs a lot of times will be the ones uh, facilitating co-show discussions or outreach uh you know with their colleagues so so um do you encourage people to become dramaturgs so if there's anything else you can do do that first um, but <laughs> no, I, I really, I, I absolutely believe in vocation. 
So, you know, like, uh, like uh, Martine's uh, mentor did for her is to recognize, you know, among the students and like, you know, I can recognize like, no, you should be an actor. This is your special, this is your fairy talent. You do that. But there are a lot of people who don't necessarily because dramaturgy is not the showy thing. Uh, mm -hmm. When you go to see, you may see a credit somewhere, but like, if, you know, I tell people like, if I do my job well, you won't, you won't have any idea what I did um, mm -hmm. when you come to see the show. And that's, you know, it, it's sort of the blessing of the curse of being a, being a dramaturg. So I think those of us who are um, already working in the field, it's, it's sort of incumbent on us to recognize and students coming us and people that we're working with to be like, oh, I think you should check this out. This may be a thing that will be fulfilling for you, um, that this line of work, this vocation. To, to add to that, my, my, my realist, my realist answer is uh, that yes, you should, you should be a dramaturg if it is something that is of interest to you and it is something that lights fire in, 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 in you, if it's something that makes sense to you as who you are as an artist and as a human being trying to connect with the world. Um, but getting but I also say that uh, one of the things that I am desperately hoping for is that when when our field restarts that people will remember how instrumental dramaturgs were during this time and actually start compensating them and compensating them appropriately for their time and their expertise because I think that is one major thing that I cannot I would be remiss if I didn't say that one of the major issues in our field is that People don't like to compensate, either they don't like to hire us, they don't like to compensate us, or they don't like to compensate us appropriately. And that is a battle, even at this point in my career that I am still fighting, which makes me so sad, so sad. Um, and, and I mean, I've been very lucky in that a lot of the collaborators that I work with who value what I bring, and hence the reason why I'm in that space and in that room, advocate for me. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I will tell anyone uh, that is looking to be in this field is that you have to learn how to advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. That is part of the training. Um, and, and, and if there's any part of you that is, is scared of the idea of advocating for yourself and for your worth, then maybe, maybe now's not the time to be a dramaturg. Um, you know, let some of us loud mouths who will continue to keep fighting that battle and hopefully we'll win it and then <laughs> come in after we've finished paving that way of appropriate compensation for the value that we bring into a space. But, you know, I would say if it is something that fuels you, like I love being a dramaturg and I love the life skills that dramaturgy has bestowed upon me because I always tell my students this, I was like, dramaturgy is life skills. It's not just theater skills, it's life skills. <laughs> so my students, for example, know that when they come into my office, if they're coming in with some sort of issue, the thing I'm gonna say to them is, okay, let's dramaturg this together. What is the story that is being told here? And how can we change this narrative <laughs> to, for it to do what it is that we need it to do? And so I think, you know, I'm gonna say, yes, come in with open arms, open hearts, and know that there is still work to be done. So ready to roll up your sleeves. That would be my, my advice. I, I think it is one of the main differences between European theaters and also New York theater, American theater. There is no drama talk inside. And how many shows have we seen where we say, I wish they would have just talked to someone. See, like, you look at a car, you see the color and the form. You see, what a great car. But actually what that makes the car run is the inside, the tuning, the motor, the systems, the, the suspensions. And this is like the... You know, to fine tune it, to make it work, I think, you know, you do uh, need uh, uh, the dramaturg and it's not just the driver or the outside of the car. We only at the very end focus on it would be, it would be better. And uh, I think it is really, uh, this, this time has showed up anything, this time of Corona, where we do actually listen. We, I mean, we talk to each other, we listen in the, your arising Phoenix and so many uh, have started really listening to each other. This is a time where it becomes of significance. Um, the dramaturgy field also, as many people argue, and we might do that the same at the Siegel Center, also grew in a way. There's dance dramaturgy, um, and, and now there's a dramaturgy of light, of installation, video, uh, of uh, off-site, as Bertie Fogman said, or site-specific work where you work on. So it also moved or developed new arms and legs, you know, towards something that where the text is not at the center, the decentering, what Martine 
uh, said before, but perhaps also is happening. Um, do you see American dramaturgs um, as, as part of that change also? Absolutely. Uh, do you see that? Do, do, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think even just part of my, my resume would be a good example of that. Like I got to work very closely at doing what I affectionately call music turgy with the Louisville Orchestra and thinking about how, how does orchestral music contribute to storytelling? That was one of the most amazing experiences of my entire life. And I have to admit that doing that has made me really interested in other types of turgy, as a, other, other turgy, as I like to call it. So doing dance turgy has been something that's now I've started to work in. Been doing more work with immersive theater experiences and themed park, theme and themed park entertainment experiences. I've been doing some new work with that. And that's been amazing and exciting because, you know, just thinking about how much storytelling really matters on a, on a larger level that we don't always give credit to um, or think about like, you know, I don't know how many people really besides, you know, potentially dramaturgy nerds like us <laughs> go to a place like a theme park and really start to think about what is the story being crafted from the moment you set foot into the, the space of that theme park to the moment that you get back into your car or however you got there and leave. Like, how is that narrative being unfolded and, and, and given to you? And what are you sort of consciously and subconsciously taking in as you're traveling through those spaces? So I think that, um, and the fact that those spaces are actually embracing dramaturgs because they're starting to understand. And I mean, even in film, you're starting to see, you know, they, you, they have, we have all kinds of names in different industries. Like, I think my favorite one that happened relatively recently was in Jordan Peele's film company hired uh, a, essentially a dramaturg. I forget exactly what the name of the, the, the title was, but I remember reading the thing and I brought it to my dramaturgy class because I was like, what does it sound like this person does? And they were like, they're a dramaturg for a film company. Exactly. That is exactly what they do. So I, I, I think it's exciting and fun that there's this sort of new, new-ish frontier <laughs> to be explored. What about you, Ken? Uh, yeah, I, I one of one of my first jobs while I was still in Seattle was working for uh, Paul Allen's company um, in some new museum projects. He was the the funder of uh, Experience Music Project, which is now called um, Mopop under the Space Needle, but it's interactive museum. And so we had some other things on the table. And I got a temp job. I just happened to fall into something. I was like oh, I can do this, right? Like it was all dramaturgical work. It was like visitor experience, user experience, anything that's like design process, structure. Um, so, you know, some of the work that we've been doing in the last few years is just finding folks in other fields who are dramaturgs who don't know the word because they haven't come up through theater, but they're practicing committing acts of dramaturgy all over the place and having more conversations um, between fields about the work and also to expose people who may who may go through, you know, some uh, more traditional MFA dramaturgy programs to know that like you can apply this training in a lot of fields that are actually really satisfying, really interesting work. Because look, you know, most of us, even if we have get get the chance to have an institutional gig that pays the the bills, you know, it's pushing more towards a gig economy. So you know, to be able to understand how to put yourself out there and use your skills and find the work and develop the relationships. Um, is super important. So, so we're doing a lot of that work too and in, in connecting the dots and also just inviting folks, you know, LMDA is sort of a strange uh, name for an organization if you, if you practice this thing in like not theater. Um, but the conversations that we have, I think we found, once we found, identified those people and pulled them into the organization, the conversations that we've had, it's win-win, right? Because people inside theater are like, oh, figuring out all these other ways that people are applying it. And then folks outside the theater who may be like the lone storyteller in their endeavor, find an organization and collaborators. They're like, yeah, I get what you do, you know, come, we'll, we'll be your support system. So, so that's been really exciting. So thanks for that. And I was saying to add to that really quickly, one of the things I want to give a quick shout out to also is LMDA Mexico, because I've learned so much through our, uh, our members in Mexico about how storytelling is being shaped by dramaturgs in that country. And I think that is fascinating. And part of me wishes that we would take some lessons from our, <laughs> from our- We did a real outreach uh, to Mexico. Um, I, I would like to know more about, tell us a little bit. 
mm, part of me feels like Ken has to start that story because I just sort of picked up the mantle from where. He... I know, I know. Well, it's just, you know, a great thing that we had sort of these overlapping terms as as presidents. You have like a president elect year, and then two years to do, and then like two mm -hmm. years you're stuck in the organization. This is the past president. You got stuff to do, um, but it's been really fabulous because you know essentially in our overlap time, um, Martine and I ran the organization together, and we're still very much involved. But uh, LMDA. 15 years ago now, uh, changed its name officially from Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of America to Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the Americas, mostly because uh, a good chunk of the membership was Canadian uh, and LMDA Canada had been established. So what's a more inclusive name? But that wasn't, uh, although some uh, of the leaders at that time had taken an exploratory trip to Mexico City and established some connections, we had, as an organization, hadn't really um, committed to that. So one of the things I did when I, when I was elected is just sort of throw out there, I'm like, we need to meet not in the US and Canada for one of our conferences. And we committed to it. Um, it's just taken a long time to do. And we were supposed to meet this year in June. We'd already done it and committed to it as Martine was finishing up her presidency. And then we had to postpone um, because of pandemic. So we took our conference online. But then we had like more people attend the conference than ever in this really international web that spawned and out of about it, which is right? Or some, yeah, yeah. Some... It was more than Maybe that. More. I think, I think, yeah, I think like it's more than 400 people. Yeah. And um, from like, I think it said so like cool. 30 something different countries and it was just like, what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is one of the things like, right, we're meeting on Zoom because we can't be in the same space until, you know, there's none of that health concern. But one of the benefits has been access you know, for mm -hmm. people who have the, the internet and the mm -hmm. device to connect, but, um, but that's been wonderful and to, and to really um, fuel uh, international sense of dramaturgical conversations. We have an international dramaturgy lab now, which is super, super exciting. And, you know, we'll be in Mexico next year and, uh, and, and be on the ground there. And then just an ongoing commitment. And then if that gets established, can we expand to more of the hemisphere, right? It's still just North America. There's a lot of people who live in the rest of the hemisphere, but we're already making connections overseas, mm -hmm. right? To Asia, to, to UK, to, to other dramaturgs who work in other parts of Europe. And uh, we'll just keep going. It's, we have the tools now and to not keep going is ridiculous. And we're also trying to invest, like for example, in Mexico, invest in some simultaneous translation, you know, cause we can't, for us native speakers, we can't all expect people like Frank who's operating in a second language to just like do it. Like everyone else has to do the work too to expand the conversations and learn more languages or find tools to have those conversations. I mean, if it works out next week, we have people from the Asian Dramaturgy Networks uh, with us. But what did you learn from Mexico? What you, uh, Martin, you said, I, I learned something. What did you learn? I learned quite a few things. Number one, I just learned about how does theater function in Mexico, which, you know, unfortunately, there's so much, so much of the educational system and so much of the structures that are in place here in the US aren't necessarily, we're not talking about what is happening in other countries in a nitty gritty way. We are talking about maybe the, the, the dramatic literature that comes out of there, maybe mm. some of the artists that come from out of other countries, but we're not talking about how does the industry look in other places. Um, and so I've learned a lot about that. I've also just learned about um, sort of the different ways in which dramaturgy is talked about, done. Like I think we actually had a connection, we, we have still have a connection with the Asian Dramaturgs Network. And I forget now off the top of my head, which country it is. I wanna think I'm, I'm maybe I'm misquoting, but I think it was Malaysia, but the word for dramaturg translates into English as soulmate, which I think is such a really interesting thought in terms of how a dramaturg functions in a room. And so if you start to think about and, and learn from other countries, how are they doing this work? What can we learn about A, how we can do things better and doing it in a respectful way that honors the fact that it is not the way that our industry started, but it is the way, but we've learned from other um, from other countries and from other cultures, like how they how they are doing the work, and you know, and and just sort of incorporating that knowledge into like the database that is what we do in the U.S. Um, and and yeah, so that that's a lot of it. I've just been learning so much about how the industry works in other places, and specifically how dramaturgy fits into those industries. Mm -hmm. No, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, quite a time, and um, and I think. 
um, as, as you both said and hoped, and I think it's rather, I think it will be more important than before, you know, to think about what we are doing and why. And as came out in many talks at the Siegel talk, how are we doing it? How do we, in our work, when we create something on stage, do we just represent the power structures and how many people are, you know, at the table or say, let's get rid of the table. I like that very much, what you said, you know, how, how do you really do the work? How do you produce it? How is everybody paid? Uh, how people are connected to it? You know, can, can they really work as an ensemble? We see that in many places. There are two, three directors now, two, three dramaturgs, um, two, three theaters co-producing. So things are changing. And also the how is important because theater is a model. If it's important at all, it's a model in a symbolic, imaginary, but also real space. We see something can be done differently. And if we don't do it, we don't try out new forms. How can the country even do it? So we have to be doing that. And I think dramaturgy is essential in the Americas. And it's, I think it's an urgent and important uh, change, you know, if dramaturgy gets a bigger footprint. It means also something much larger for the country because it means, you know, to listen, to understand, to see the social context, community, global context, and to put everything uh, as the whole life, as Martin said, in, 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 in it. So I think that is um, of importance. Uh, yeah, new books coming out, and Catania worked for many years on a book, it's gonna come out soon. By the way, she's also creating a wiki page of the history um, of dramaturgy in America with everybody listed and people who did things. I think this is something to look forward to. Peter Eckersall who's only is gonna come out with a new book. Uh, there have been many more recent books. So um, it is something we all have to pay um, attention to. The gaming industry in a way also is an interesting field but dramaturgy is sig significant in the center of it. Games like The Journey or others were really people like at Story or game developers think in that way. And these are people who also really look at money. Yes. And they say, that's important. It's a better product. And when we have it, and I think everybody from the smallest downtown companies to the biggest, biggest Broadway productions, and they do that, you know, no, this is of, of important. This makes a real difference, but also represents a model of, uh, you know, humans, people create something together and really think about all the layers, the complexity of this world that is reflected on stage. And it should not be simple. It should not be just soda drinks, you know, where you feel good for a moment, but then it's just a lot of sugar and afterwards you don't really take <laughs> it with you. And great theater, you remember it. Um, if we come in closer now to the end, let's say someone is listening now, and says, maybe I'll be a dramaturg or not. What, what, would you, what would you say, you know, why dramaturgy is so significant, but also that person, what should he, she, she, her, what, what, what would they, what should they do and focus on? If they dedicate a way, their life in a way it is, it's the way working in theater is a way of living. It's a way how you spend your life. But so if they do that, what should they really be doing and why is it important? You go professor. <laughs> Fair. Uh, I, I tell my students um, and anyone who comes to me who says they're interested in dramaturgy is uh, here are the things that they need to do. One, read more work. Reading plays is essential to being a dramaturg because in some ways through the osmosis of read, continuing to read, A, back to dramaturgy and dramaturgs as resources, now you have more plays under your belt in order to be able to participate in conversations about why this play, why this play now. But then also you start to learn what is it that makes this artist tick who wrote this or what is it that, um, you know, what is it about the way that this play is structured that is speaking to our society right now? Or what are the issues that are at the pulse of um, what is happening right now? Because I, I keep telling my students, one of my favorite things when I read for a lot of new play festivals, like Great Plains Theater Conference or like the O'Neill, et cetera, is that I learn so much about what is on people's minds and hearts you know, what, what was on pre people's minds and hearts the previous year by the submissions that we get that year. And so just read more plays and then find, find dramaturgs, find, find your tribe in the dramaturgy community who's doing the work that you want to do and that you aspire to do and connect with them. I don't know too many unfriendly dramaturgs. 
Um, and to be honest, like even if you do manage to find one unfriendly dramaturg, I'm 100% sure if you send out, like if you, for every like at least 100 emails you'll get, there, there, there may be one unfriendly dramaturg in there. So just find other dramaturg and ask them how are they doing the thing that they're doing. Um, I get the, I get those emails all the time and I'm happy to share because I am all about knowledge sharing and I don't think, you know, there's any secret to, there's nothing secretive or secret about what it is that I've done about my career. I'm always honest that my career is like a combination of like determination, pluck, like luck <laughs> and, and just like putting myself out on the line and reaching out and, and, and connecting with others. So that, that is my advice. I don't know. Ken probably has better advice. <laughs> I think that's it. I mean, one of the things that I love about dramaturgy is, you know, just like any other theater specialty, there are as many ways to practice dramaturgy as there are dramaturgs. Um, you know, so there's, there's a ready joke, like, you know, ask, ask 10 dramaturgs, dramaturgs a question and you'll get a hundred different answers, right? Like, there's just like, um, there's plenty of ways to do that. And so, you know, one of the things we do is certainly to, to advocate for folks who are interested um, in working with a dramaturg, as I always say, like, please interview five people, you know, because there's so many uh, uh, different folks out there and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have a, you, you're gonna develop a close relationship. So figure out if there's a match there, if there's a way, if there's a simpatico, if there's a way of thinking, or else to talk about, you know, people to um, consider, you know, what, what is the, what is the play you're putting on? What is the project you're working on? Um, who's missing from the room to make this project the best it can be, you know, in terms of voices. And if you want to diversify your table, the dramaturgical position is one of those places to to do it. Bring in bring in another perspective. Bring in some some more different life experience um, uh, into the table. But uh, for folks who are interested in you know, because I, I, I even though I'm not a, a professor at the moment, uh, I do get the opportunity of talking with a lot of students and, and mentoring folks. And I really just say like, get out there, read as many plays as you can. Um, maybe volunteer to be a play reader. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, apply for those positions. And some of those gigs pay like 10 bucks a script or 20 bucks a script, which is fantastic. And we advocate for that. Um, but to just to like be able to read a play, analyze it and talk about it. That's like a fundamental skill to develop as a dramaturg, to be able to like talk about, use words to talk about something structurally. So, you know, like what's happening, why this play, why this play now, what does it mean? Read deeply in theater and read widely everything mm -hmm. else. Agreed. Um, just to just to know what bodies of knowledge your particular project is tapping into, learn how to have conversations with experts in other fields. And if that's like something that's interesting to you, if you're someone who's generally curious, have a lot of interests, you'll find room to practice your art um, in this field and you'll 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 make your own way uh, through it. And uh, but again, I feel like you'll know if you're that kind of person. <laughs> I've met other dramaturgs. You're a dramaturg, aren't you, right? Like, but that's, that's uh, something, it's something you can train for, but I think it's also like, who are you mm -hmm. as a human being in this world? And is that something that you'll just find your way in because you've got that fire, you've got a dramaturgical fire already lit in, lit in you by your DNA. Mm. Yeah, and we really do need dramaturgs and we need uh, good dramaturgs. As the final uh, question, we often also ask that, what inspires you at the moment? What do you read or listen to in music um, or TV, movie, series? What do you, what do you guys uh, look at at the moment or listen to? Well, I know, I know uh, Martina is an avid gardener. So I know like she's inspired by that and, uh, you know, her animals. This is true. <laughs> Uh, I'm a little impressed that my dog has not come in here looking for pets the entire time we've been oh, in this call. The dog. Where is it? Where is he? She's, I, I don't know where she is. I think it's, I, I don't know. That's actually a really good question. She might be with, uh, with my spouse outside. But uh, yes, I, to me, you know, I think what inspires me is just this idea of growth in general. So hence the gardening hence uh, the, the wanting to be around animals. Like I think uh, there's so much life around us generally. And I think especially in a time like this where um, everything is about, is focused on uh, sickness and death, there's something to be said about finding joy in life um, and living life. And so uh, part of what I've been trying to balance is back to the realist and the optimist 
and gardening brings out the optimism in me. Um, but I think what inspires me, honestly, and I know this is going to sound like a bit, a, a bit of a, a, a foot, like a punt of the question, but re what really inspires me are other artists and especially my students, um, because they are the next generation of what this world is. And I, I am desperately and amazingly hopeful that they will be, uh, they will take all of the things that we have managed to put in place and do even better with those things and be better than we were about it. And I'm not saying this and that it's their responsibility to fix all the things. I'm hoping that we will have fixed a lot of things by the time they're taking over. But I am inspired by the way they look at theater. I am inspired by the playwrights that I work with at the Playwright Center. Some of the stuff that they are writing is just amazing and brilliant. And I am inspired by the legacy of playwrights also. Like uh, I find there's so much joy in history to be like mind and just looking at the wealth of like uh, dramatic knowledge that exists in, you know, especially in like Nigerian theater and in Asian theater and specifically one of my favorite places to read is I, I like a lot of Korean theater. Um, and so what is how is especially the intersections of technology and theater are really interesting to me and, and the Koreans are doing it. They are doing it. So that is where I find inspiration. <laughs> Um, I have found uh, inspiration in um, in cycling, which I never really did before. I'm a lifelong runner, um, but uh, we spent a lot of the pandemic time in, in California um, in the Bay Area, and they've got a great Bay Trail there. We have a bike, so I was like, I'm gonna get on the bike. Um, and so I was just taking really long bike rides and listening to books, which, you know, I read books, but actually listening to books on Audible. Um, and finding that like physical activity connected with, and I like to, you know, read or listen to a lot of nonfiction. So, um, you know, sociology or like, I, you know, listen to Stacey Abrams book, on, you know, uh, history of voting and voter suppression. And it was just like, I found myself um, uh, interacting with uh, or consuming information and thinking in a different way of like listening to a nonfiction book on a long bike ride. Um, so that's been, and, and I've just like, I just kept going. I was like, what's the next book? What's the next book? And listening to a book just uh, versus reading it and something about the rhythm of cycling and listening and, and, uh, uh, and, and consuming information. That was inspiring. Um, I, I was also inspired uh, with, with the shutdown and less, uh, less plane traffic and less um, car traffic when everyone had to stay at home. I was like, the air is cleaner like you know and I was just noticing I was like oh here's this here's this respiratory illness that has affected uh humanity and the and the and our planet's getting a chance to breathe um that 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 inspires me I was like we can we can do this we can do this we can fix our planet so that's inspiring me and uh and I've been and, and when the museums have uh, opened galleries have opened up I've been going um, and just looking at uh, artists' work, visual artists' work in particular, um, and being inspired by that. Like old, old folks, like if I go to the Met and just see like stuff that's thousands of years old from all over the world, that's been inspiring me. And like, what, what sticks? I've been thinking about legacy. Like what, what from this thing that we're doing right now, um, what are we gonna leave behind? What is gonna, how have we responded to this? Um, so I've been just sort of deriving inspiration from other artists who responded to other things over history um, and leaving those things behind. Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, um, that's good advice and uh, good, uh, good, good, good practice. Really, thank you. Thank you both for taking the time and uh, giving us a little view inside that world of uh, dramaturgy that also sounded exciting. Or we, I went in those over 100 talks, this is the, one of the most upbeat. So this is also stands for something that's interesting. Uh, about dramaturgy the for the win. Right, yeah. <laughs> really? Uh, Doing a dramaturgy dance, dramaturgy party. Something is <laughs> happening here. And uh, and maybe, you know, it's uh, also the, that change that, that will happen and already has happened that this is um, part of it. So really, thank you for taking the time to share with us your, your experience and your, your thoughts, your visions, and also your, your concerns. So this is of real importance to everyone. And uh, we continue this week. Uh, tomorrow we have Alejo Gantner, who is one of the great curators internationally 
of theater and performance uh, from the Edinburgh Festival to PS122, how it was named at the time he created the new space, and then as with the Onassis Foundation at the moment. And who knows where his long uh, dramaturgical life will take in. Also, I think like you guys, he has many chapters. Um, so we will hear from him what he thinks, also what his colleagues are thinking uh, at the moment, you know, in the kind of international curators. Uh, 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 circuit and then Hillary Miller, uh, Professor Hillary Miller was also a practitioner, but she is a researcher and professor and teacher, and uh, she wrote about New York City wow. in the seventies when it was broke, when it was kind of a dead city, and when art was part of the resurgent and wh what great great contribution it made New York, what it was also kept people in New York City and uh, also got real support at the time from the city and something where we have to look at now too. This is the same devastating moment if not more and for the arts so are there any lessons to learn from and so we'll be I'm also looking forward to, to that conversation so really thank you thank you and I hope it was uh, also as meaningful as it was for us and our listeners it's really important to hear from you and this is such a significant field a bit in the shadows of the sidelines of the stage of the theater but um, uh, yeah I think it's the one that also makes it work it's of uh, utmost significance and thank you for sharing it means a lot to all of us here so I hope you will have a good lunch now and uh, uh, go back cycling or uh, in the garden and um, and let's see hope and see that we will be part of the change we want to see and let's stay in conversation you know the Siegel and many others in the New York we are trying to put together a festival in 2022 in the summer, uh, the New York International Festival of the Arts, and see how we can, you know, collaborate and put voices out yeah. and the things you know, in the parks, in the parks, in the parking lots, in all five boroughs, but also in the theaters. And um, so we have to do something. And um, and uh, this contribution you guys are making is essential and significant. So um, it's something we will also get advice from you to do. So bye bye, and to HowlRound, thanks again for hosting us. Um, they are such a wonderful platform, Sia, VJ, and Andy Lerner from the Siegel Center and everybody who supports it. And of course, listeners. I know when we started in March, very few podcasts were out uh, in the, this kind of world of theater. We move in and uh, now so much has moved online. So it means a lot to us that you take the time to listen. And we hope that it's also something meaningful uh, for you in there because as uh, Martin said, uh, life, real life, and also theater, but also dramaturgy is connected. And we could also think, how do we dramaturg our own life? What's of importance? What should we listen to? All the lessons Martin and Ken talked about, you can apply to our time of planet Earth. How do we use it? What do we do? What's of importance? So uh, this is uh, all essential. So uh, thank you. And uh, I hope to see you soon one day at the Seagull and uh, or openings. And I cannot tell you how much I miss the theater and uh, openings and uh, things on the stage. Uh, so I hope it will be back soon, but it doesn't look like before next fall, if at all, at the time. So thank